Tallahi wa barakatuhu. Allah wa Allah wa Akbar Allah wa Akbar Allah wa Akbar Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا إله إلا الله وحده نصر عبد وعز جند وهزم الأحزاب وحده لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك له الحمد يحيي ويميت وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله قال الله تعالى في كتابه أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تكاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون O believers there are many aspects of Islam that we may hold sacred as individuals and as an ummah and we can say that the salat is one of those things. You'll see us pray as individuals, and you'll see us even pray in Jamaat, in congregation as an Ummah, and today being Yom al this is one example of that, that we gather on Friday to fulfill Allah Ta'ala's order for the male Muslim, sane, mature individual. We gather to accomplish that order of Allah Ta'ala. But as with the orders of Allah Ta'ala, there are prerequisites or conditions or shurut. Some obligations that we have indeed have a shart, and as individuals we accomplish them. And also as an ummah we accomplish them. But as with Islam, we have two kinds of fard. We have fard ayn and fard kifaya. We have the individual obligations and then we have the communal obligations that are upon the ummah to achieve. Or even a significant amount or enough of the ummah to achieve. So these are not conditions that can be met by an individual when it comes to fard kifaya. So again, we have acts that we hold sacred and again, the Salat is a 
prime example of that. But can you imagine someone making the salah without wudu? Can you imagine? What is that salah like for someone that neglects the wudu but they make salah? What would that be like? See, wudu is a shart. It is a prerequisite, a condition for the salah. And the fiqh rule says that whatever is necessary to accomplish a fard, an obligation, is itself an obligation. This is from the fuqaha. Now, it, it, is, it is basic fundamental Islam, but the fuqaha said it, so I'll give, I'll give it to them because we tend to listen them. But basically, we know that wudu is fard because we have a text for it. But what if we did not have a text that said wudu is fard? Would it be fard? Of course it would be fard. Why? Because you cannot accomplish a salah, you cannot accomplish the prayer without wudu. Or ghusl. When I say wudu, I mean the ghusl also, the, the big wudu. So, you can't accomplish the prayer without it. So, even if we didn't have a text, because the salah, we know it to be so much fard, we do it as individuals and we do it as ummah, together. And we don't leave it off. But can we leave off the wudu? No, we can't. Because it's a prerequisite to accomplish salat. The iqama. The iqama is fard. As an individual, before you make salat, you have to make iqama. And as an, a jamaat, as a, a congregation, you have to make iqama. This is fard. Adhan is not fard. Adhan is to notify that the time of salat has uh, come upon us. The Aqama lets us know that it's time to pray, that we're about to fulfill that obligation. So even as an individual, you make Iqama. And as an Ummah, we make Iqama when we pray together in Jamaat. The Iqama is a Sharm. So, one example, we were having Halaqa, I think it was in, I'll say Houston, Texas, we were having Halaqa. Uh, and we all got up for the Fajr. Because this was a two, three day halaqa. So we all got up for the Fajr. And uh, I guess uh, the, the, the imam that was leading, he did not call for, perhaps he was maybe a little drowsy, he didn't call for the iqamah. Uh, so we stood up and we made Fajr. So he turned around and said, did we make iqamah? No, no, I, no one heard iqama. No, no one made it, and even the one directly behind him, it should be the one that make iqama or that even. So he said, "Did we make it?" He turned around. He said, "No, I don't remember anyone making it." He said, "We will count that as a as a, a, a nafala, you know, a nawafal, a, a voluntary, and then we will make fajr now." So we rose and we made fajr, you know, because the iqama is a far to achieve the salah, the far salah. So, if we can't imagine salah without wudu, if we can't imagine salah without iqama, because it is a shard, then we don't need an evidence, although we have it, we don't need an evidence that the iqama is far. We don't need an evidence that wudu is far. Because we have an evidence that the salah is far. And it must be accomplished. It must be accomplished. Again, dealing with the big wudu, the ghusl. Omar radiallahu an comes out and he leads the salat in jama'at. You know, he leads the salat in congregation. And after he led the salat, he left and came back and started praying. And when they inquire, why are you doing such? I think it was Fajr. He said, why are you doing such? He said, I forgot that I was in, you know, I was jindab. You know, I, I had uh, relations. You know, or what have you, and I forgot. So now I have to make my fajr now. They said, Oh, Omar, do we have to also repeat? He said, No, no. Your fajr is good. I'm the one that made the mistake. So someone may say, because Muslims, they throw intentions around a lot. Intentions are very important in Islam. We'll talk about intentions. But intentions are very important in Islam. But Muslims throw it out, throw out intentions. So some Muslims will say, I'm not going to repeat the fajr. I had good intentions. But you were not in the state. 
of tahara. You're not in a state of purity to make that fajr. So go get pure and come and make the fajr. You have to achieve the sharut. The sharut are very important to achieve what Allah orders us to do. We have to be in the condition to achieve it. So yes, Omar an repeated fajr for himself, but it did not affect the, uh, the Musalim. You know, it did not affect them. So this is really, really important. This is really, really important for us as an ummah. Fasting, a prerequisite, a shout for fasting is the niyyah, the tension. You have to make intention. Some say you make it out and some say no, you make it inside. Some say you can make it the night before, so on and so forth. Besides the disagreement, they all agree that niyyah is a prerequisite for the fasting. Okay? So, can you imagine just fasting with no niyyah? You have, you have none? Can you imagine it? No. Because it's a prerequisite. So all of this is stuff, stuff that we're familiar with. Now let's get to the, let's fry the big fish as they say. Now, whose job, or let me ask it, ask it a different way. Is it obligatory to protect our Muslim ummah? As individual, if someone is harming you, that's my life. Allah loaned it to me, I'm going to give it for you. I'm going to give it. Wallahi, male, female, child, adult, elderly. I would give it because that's what I'm here for. I'm here to make the next ascension beyond this dunya. I want to get out of here, especially before taxes. I want to get out of here, you know. So the issue is that it's obligatory for me to defend my Muslim brother, sister, uh, uh, Muslim youth, uh, elderly. It's, it's obligatory for me if I have the ability to do so. It's obligatory. What about the ummah? Whose job is it to defend the ummah? I don't want to eat this, make this question rhetorical because someone may raise their hand and say United Nations. Someone may raise their hand and say NATO. Astaghfirullah wa'adhin. Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Quran, O you who believe, alaykum and fusikum, O you who believe, take care of yourselves. Upon you is the obligation to take care of yourselves. That means who will defend us as an ummah. And if it's far to defend our Muslim women and children and men, elderly or young, if it's obligatory, then whose job is that? And are we fulfilling that order? I'll tell you a big secret. We're not being defended anywhere on the, on the globe. Not one speck of dirt, not one grain of sand is safe haven for Muslims. Especially someone that's on their deen. That, that uh, enjoins the ma'roof and forbids the munkar. Ones that gives the dawah to Islam. It is not safe for them. It is not safe for them. So, whose job is it to defend the ummah? And should we be concerned about one Muslim suffering? Or should we be concerned about the millions of Muslims suffering? Should we be concerned at all? Because maybe we're not doing so bad here in Dal Kufr. You know, maybe we're not doing so bad. Everywhere is Dal Kufr, that's another discussion. But we're not doing so bad here. Did, you know, we look at the history, and, and I talked about the attacks on Islam. How they say Islam is just a religion, Islam has no system, you know. And, and, and they established these groups to make Islam look bad. I talked about that. But there's a fourth attack. And what is that fourth attack? It's to look into the history. Remember, this history doesn't have Isnad like we, we, we have with the, uh, the Ahadith and so on and so forth. It doesn't have that. You know, uh, but they look into the history. They find something that uh, one of our uh, Umarat, one of our Amirs or Imams did wrong. They say, oh, look at that, look at that. Nobody looks at that for Sunnah. Nobody looks at that to, uh, to, to, uh, in order to apply an action to the Qarina, which is weighing you know, uh, uh, the evidences for whether it's Fard or just Sunnah, so on and so forth. No one looks toward history for that. But the, the enemies of Islam, the fourth attack, they always look to the history, they look for something bad. Find something bad with the Rasul Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Find something bad with him, then we're talking. Now we're talking. But you find nothing bad with him, and that is our example. 
You ever notice these individuals never criticize Uthman عن, for the fitna that happened during his time, which was not his fault? You ever notice they, they don't criticize him? Why they don't criticize Uthman? Why they don't criticize Ali عن, who there's a lot of fitna during that time? Why don't they criticize him? Because they have an agenda to look for you know, the Ijma al-Sahaba is a source of, a, of a hukum sharia. It's a source of legislation. So they don't want to look there. Yes, there were problems there. And they solved it by Islam. Always Islam. Always Islam. We always solved our issues by Islam, by the Islamic legislation. We always did. Yes, mistakes were made as individuals and, and rulers and so on and so forth. The ummah has so much authority. You know what checks and balances? The Kufa talks about checks and balances, executive, legislative, judicial branch. You know, it says checks and balances. How much check and balance do you have? You have an ummah that gives a bayah to a leader to rule us by Islam. And if he fails to do so, we take it and we give it to someone else. How much check and balance can you have? Billion Muslims are looking at you. One Amir, one single leader. And, and don't get too happy. When Islam comes back, and it will come back, Wallahi. Don't get too happy with being in all these elections. You know, elect this person, elect that person. Don't get too happy. Because we only have the authority to elect the Khalifa. We only have that authority. He appoints everyone after that. And is responsible for him. So when they act up, it's on him. What did the young alim tell Hajjaj? What did he tell him? Hajjaj says, what do you think of me? Because he heard he was saying something. Because the our ulema in the past used to say something <laughs> to, to, the, to the, uh, those responsible. And he was just a governor. People talk like he was the Khalifa. No, he was the governor. The pro problematic, but yes, he was just a governor. So he said, what do you think of me? He said, you don't want to know what I think of you. He said, well, what do you think about the Khalifa? He said, he's a sinner and you're one of his sins. And for that, he was killed. Those are our blessed ulema. Those are the good ones. Not the ones that sit on the lap of the king and, and, and only work they do is shoveling cement on the throne to make sure it stays stable. It doesn't shake. You ever been to a restaurant and the table moves? Oh, the throne won't move because those ulema are shoveling cement under it. Make sure it's nice and firm. Every fatwa they need. Oh, jihad, oh, uh, go, go fight for the CIA, I mean, excuse me, go fight for uh, the Muslims in, in uh, Afghanistan, you know? You know? Oh, Bosnia? Oh, don't go fight there, because uh, Bill Clinton, uh, excuse me, uh, Islam says, you know? And that's what we have today. So if it's the duty of the ummah to make sure the ummah is safe and secure, then whose job is that to do that? We, we have to elect a ruler whose job is it. We have to put the responsibility on somebody because us as individuals, we can't do it. We are part of the oppressed. The prerequisite to make sure the Muslims are secure, the men, women, children, elderly, and young is upon the ruler that we don't have, that we don't talk about, that we don't care to hear about. We'd rather hear about Toba, Toba, Toba every Friday. Keep making your Toba. Keep making Toba. For yourself as an individual. When Allah raised you as an individual, you'll find out that you had more obligations than just yourself. You're guaranteed. You will find out. You had more obligations than just yourself. So, one sister cries out. Ya Mutassim, she cries out the Khalifa's name because he's responsible. Because the Romans had abducted her. And I didn't hear about the report of the rape. I didn't hear about a report of uh, you know, uh, her being molested or anything like that. But she cried his name and when he heard it, he was a head of the army. Can you imagine a ruler today? You know, can't even get up because they're so fat. You know, can you imagine them getting up today and helping anybody? Israel apparently cried Saudia's name. So they got the, the Air Force to go help them do joint bombings in Yemen and so on and so forth. You know, this is a problem that we have. They are crying. Our men, women, and children, elderly and young, are crying. And there's nobody accomplishing the shark, the prerequisite, to make sure they're safe. Omar radiallahu an walked around when he became the Khalifa. First of all, when he received the bayah on the minbar, he cried. 
like a baby. And someone in the back stood up. So Omar, why are you crying? Are you trying to make us cry? He said, no, I fear that because of my reputation, because of Omar's, you know, uh, stature, so on and so forth, that I will, you will, they will see some crookedness in me. Some crookedness. Not saying kufr, but why? Not clear kufr, but just crookedness. Meaning he makes some mistakes. Khata, you know, some mistakes. So he said, Omar, he said, I fear that if Omar, if there's some crookedness in me, people will fear to correct me. And he said, oh, Omar, he said, if we see any crookedness in you, we'll correct it, even with our swords. Did he say, ya haram, he like, haram, you can't talk to the ruler like that. You can't threaten the ruler with a sword. I'm beyond the wahi. Because no matter what I do, you can't remove me. No khuruj, haram, haram, haram. He didn't say any of that. He smiled. He said, MashaAllah, Allah has blessed me with an ummah that will correct the crookedness in Umar because he feared the hellfire. Who of us will live forever? None. None of us will live forever. So therefore, we have to accomplish these obligations to Allah Ta'ala. And what leads to an obligation becomes an obligation itself. Whose job is it to feed the ummah? The ummah starving. He said, oh, there's an Islamic organization. It's not their job. This guy, uh, Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, you think he called us Dr. Love? He called us all kind of names. This guy gave away some millions of dollars. Maybe he bought a T-shirt. I don't know, maybe a T-shirt for a million dollars. It was some, some trifling thing that he bought, you know. And some Muslims said, subhanAllah, he could have fed so many hungry people. And I, I commented, I said, it's not his obligation to do so. It's not his obligation. It's not his obligation to feed, you know. If we have Muslim billionaire, when he gives 2.5% in zakat, his money is purified. He didn't have to give anything beyond that. He didn't have to give any sadaqah beyond that. And this is from the hadith of Rasulullah When a man said, he said, what else? He said, there's zakat. There's a tax. He said, is there any more tax beyond zakat? He said, la illa anta tawa. No, except that you volunteer. You can give sadaqah. But if a billionaire gave 2.5%, a Muslim billionaire, he's not obligated beyond that to give any, even sadaqah. He can walk around and have to smile. That's his obligation. And by Allah's calculation, that will help the world. That's how the world is fed. See, this starvation thing is new. Guess when it happened? When Islam stopped ruling. Guess when it happened? Yes. Yes. This is a new thing. Fighting for bare necessities of life. Muhammad Sallam said the son of Adam has, has no need except for three things. And that is shelter to cover himself from the elements. Food and uh, clothing on his back to hide his nakedness and shame. And food and drink. To fill his belly. That's, that's all the son of Adam needs. From the beginning of time until now, man has not changed. As far as our needs are concerned. So guess what? When the system of Islam is established, no one is homeless. No one goes around hungry. and No one walks around naked. Even if they wanted to, like outside, they couldn't do it. Whose obligation is it to feed the Muslims? Not the Islamic organization. MashaAllah, may Allah bless them. But if we, you can't keep pouring resources into the, to a thing that's not the solution. Keep giving. I'm not saying don't give. Keep giving. But don't think you're solving anything. Because I'm a human being and I'll take my own anecdotal experience. I ate. I haven't eaten breakfast today, but I ate yesterday and I woke up hungry. And I ate lunch yesterday and I was hungry again. That's why I ate dinner. So you don't solve hunger by feeding people. That's not how you solve it. You have to have a system. You have to have a system. Whose job is it to make sure the Muslims are fed? And if Allah didn't answer that question, then maybe we chose the wrong deen. If Islam doesn't have a solution to our protection and to our nourishment, then maybe we chose the wrong deen.
the prerequisites of Islam must be accomplished. If not, we'll raise or Yom Qiyamah sinful. Sinful or Yom Qiyamah because we did not accomplish the fault of the Kifaya. The communal obligation upon us. I feel a law. I'm going to be raised. As someone didn't do anything for this thing. I didn't do anything for the Muslims. I didn't do anything. We all should feel that way. We all should feel that way. May Allah tell forgive us. Holy call the Adam was for the Lord. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Part of my frustration, my frustration is that, you know, it's uh, Muhammad Sallam said that this ummah one to another is like Jasr and Wahida, like one body. When one part of the body has sleeplessness, the whole the whole body stays awake. One part of the body ails, the whole body feels it. You know, the problem, the example of the body is really really important because how does how does my body how does this hand know that this hand has the prick of a thorn? Because it sends a signal to the brain. This ummah has no brain. There's no leadership on this ummah. So how can we address the problem here? How does my blood know to coagulate and so on and so forth? To stop the bleeding, you know? How, how, how does the, uh, my, my white blood cells know to fight this and that if the brain's not sending the signal? The body doesn't function without a brain. This ummah has no brain. We have no mind. And we spend time talking about everything. We don't give no energy to the solution. You know what's equal to this ummah right now? I'm talking about myself too. What's equal to the ummah right now is the uh, American medical uh, situation. I was telling this guy today, uh, this homeless guy we were talking, and I was telling him that the money is in the treatment. So the sicker you are, the more money they make. It's called capitalism, rasmali, money head. It's called capitalism. Capital means money. Ism is the methodology. That's what it is. And I said, Europe is no better, but at least their doctors, if they get your blood pressure down, they get a bonus. In Europe, if if the doctor can get the patient to stop smoking cigarettes, they get a bonus. That's how they incentivize the doctors. And it's still a Kufr system. I say, but look at here. They want to keep you sick. They wait till you get cancer. Then they, then they put you on the treatment. But they don't tell you about uh, white sugar and, 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 and uh, st- uh, st- start eating things that produce oxygen because cancer doesn't like oxygen. And they don't tell you these types of things. You're just, you're just at the oncologist. Everybody's, you know, what, what we say in America, cha-ching. You know, that's what it's about. It's not about life. We're living un-Islamic life. Everywhere's dal kufr. Don't let the Arab clothes fool you. Don't let it. Don't let the here and the other, even though it's lower now, but don't let that fool you. Islam is when the people are protected, when the people are fed, when the people are housed. And we cannot say we are living this deen if we haven't accomplished the prerequisite in order for that to come into fruition because it was you want to look at the history and say that we uh islam is bad there's a muslim saying look at the history look at the history muslims are saying islam is bad i don't care what the kufar say the muslims are saying islam the muslims are saying islam is religion the muslims are saying that uh the uh, Islam has no ruling system the muslims are detailed ruling system and the muslims are saying that look at the Khilafah in uh, Iraq. Look at the Khilafah in Afghanistan. Look at the Khilafah in, in this African country. Look at, look at the problems. These Muslims don't look to the Rasul Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They don't look, they don't look there. Because they look there, their argument is null and void. That is the source of Hukum Sharia. That's why they don't want to look there. They're not sincere individuals. They're not sincere. Allah Ta'ala has obligated us, inshallah Ta'ala will fulfill the obligations. May Allah Ta'ala bless us and guide us to do so. Rabbana atana fi dunya hasna fi akhira hasna wa qinna adab al-nar. Subhanaka fa qinna adab al-nar. Rabbana afrik alayna sabran wa thabit aqdamana 
wansuna ala qawmi al-kafirin rabbana afrik alayna sabran wa tawaffana muslimin allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala ali muhammad kama salli ala ibrahim wa ala ali ibrahim anaka hamad al-majid allahumma barak ala muhammad wa ala ali muhammad kama barak ala ibrahim wa ala ali ibrahim anaka hamad al-majid ameen aqimu salam